Welcome to 24-7 Sports Recruiting Question and Answer here on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. If you haven't already subscribed, click that subscribe button to the 24-7 Sports Recruiting channel. And I am joined by Greg Biggins, National Recruiting Analyst. I'm Brandon Huffman, National Recruiting Editor. And we are here to answer some questions. But before we get into that, Greg, it's been a, a busy week. We had the top 247 release on Monday. We have had really the last major event of the summer occur over the weekend, Future 50 down at Bradenton IMG Academy. We had the OT7 during June. We had the Elite 11 at the end of June. There's been all kinds of events. So we recalibrated, updated the top 247. And then later that night, you dropped kind of a mini bombshell on something that had been discussed in recent weeks. What is Nico Iamalieva going to do? Not for college. We know he's going to Tennessee. What is he going to do for his senior year in high school? And Greg, you had the scoop on that. Break down what happened with Nico and where he will be playing his senior season. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure people are saying, dude, who cares? It's a high school player playing high school football. But there is a, a lot of ramifications. We're talking NFL draft uh, ramifications here, Huff. Um, why I think it's a big deal for, for Nico. So Long Beach Poly as a freshman. Downey, Warren High School. Make sure I get that distinction in there. Warren High School. Kevin Pearson always wants to make sure we know he's at Warren High School, not Downey High School uh, with your buddy Jack. Um, Warren, sophomore, junior year. He was going to go to Poly as a senior. Uh, checked in, was enrolled at Poly. Just didn't feel right for him, apparently. Uh, you know, I just, you're going to hear different sides of the story, but just talking to the family. Just never felt super comfortable there. And he was actually going to set out the year and, and just train and not play uh, as a senior. And so, uh, last week, they decided, hey, let's go back to Warren High School, play for Coach Pearson. They're super comfortable with him. They love the kids on the team. Uh, they're very comfortable, obviously, uh, just with everything about the school. So, um, again, why is it a big deal? I, because, again, when we look at the NFL draft and one of the biggest indicators of success for quarterbacks is the amount of high school games you started. It's, it's your pass attempts. It's your, you know, uh, be, being able to go out there on a Friday night and get it done. And especially Nico going into Tennessee, where I think he's got a chance to play early. Um, you don't want this guy coming in and playing early without having some senior year game experience. I think there's so much value in senior year development for me. And, and I'm not sure. I think you might be on the same page. I, I think, you know, for me, Nico has the highest ceiling of any quarterback in this class. And that was going to happen for him in terms of hitting that ceiling, at, at least not initially, without playing as a senior. So uh, it's not just him going to Warren High School. It's the fact that he's going to Warren High School to actually play a high school season that wasn't going to happen at Long Beach Paul. He was probably just going to sit out and train. Now he's at Warren High School. And uh, I think we're excited to go watch him and see how he can uh, continue to develop his, his skill set, which is obviously off the charts. That's a nice segue. A couple weeks ago, I'm on record with our, our friends at the Solid Verbal, Dan Rubenstein, Ty Hildebrandt, where they asked me who I thought the number one quarterback in the 2023 class. And I said Nico Yamalieva, in my opinion, was number one. Now, Greg, that actually leads to a greater point. One mm. of the biggest talking points in the last couple of weeks has been that Maybe Arch Manning isn't the number one quarterback in the country. Despite all four networks ranking him number one, being the unanimous number one, there are some that say they don't think he's the number one. Some of you said outlandish things like he'd be a three-star if he had a different last name. Well, that's lame. You <laughs> know that there has been the discussion point. And you mentioned with Nico him the importance of playing his senior year. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that you and I discussed when, when leading up to the show is how important are events? And I bring that up because – the biggest discussion point we had in our top 247 calls were, is Nico the number one player? Is Malachi Nelson the number one player? Or is it Dante Moore? Are those guys able to pass up Arch Manning? Arch stayed number one. You made a really compelling case for Dante Moore. He's the number two player. Nico's the number three. But you've been involved. You've been covering the Elite 11 since its inception. We haven't seen Arch at any national events. Now, Cooper Patagna saw him in his spring game. Steve Wolfong saw him in the spring ball, but we saw plenty of Dante Moore. We saw plenty of Nico. We've seen plenty of Malachi Nelson. Break down, in your opinion, why, A, it's so crucial for guys to be at events, or why it's not as crucial, but ultimately, why did we stick with Arch over Dante? Yeah, no, and I think, let's just get the philosophical thing out here right now. I think it's 2022, and two things can be true at the same time, right? I think people fully believe that either arch is number one or arch sucks those are the two things you keep seeing on twitter you've already addressed There's no it. middle ground there, and there should be a middle ground right like i i don't recommend this at home uh, i drove home from a doctor's appointment had like an hour drive and i i as i was driving again don't do this at home but i was watching arch's sophomore and junior huddle 
on my drive, and he's good. Like, let's just get that out of the way. Cooper has seen him, and, and I trust Cooper's eyes. And uh, he, he's got a, a high-level skill set. He's got a college body right now. He's a big, strong 6'4 kid. We love the, t- the two-sport athleticism that he has, a uh, basketball player. Um, he's not on a super team. And let's just get that out of the way. You, people say, oh, look at the, you know, the stats he had against this team. Or you know, we saw the ESPN game against that team. Um, he doesn't play on a team that's loaded with, with D1 t- talent. Now, saying that, he doesn't play against guys either. You know, some of the stuff that we saw, we're scrambling around, and, and, and he's, you know, he's probably bigger than some of the D linemen that, uh, that he's going up against. But I think, he's, I think he's a tremendous football player. Is he my QB1? No, right? I, I'd probably have Dante and, and Nico over him. I think you can make an argument for Malachi even being over him. But I think he's definitely an elite-level prospect. He's definitely a five-star guy. He has a huge upside. He's going to go to Texas. Again, Cooper made some great points. He's going to have a lot of success. So the issue for me, uh, you brought up the events and how important it is. I think events would have been good for Arch because I didn't think he had a dominant junior season of tape, right? When we saw Quinn Ewers, that junior tape was was off the charts for me. Bryce Young, uh, DJ Uyung and Lele, um, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, those guys had dominant elite junior level tape. So it wasn't just that Arch, you know, we didn't get a, we didn't get a chance to see him um, with our eyes at some of these events. I didn't think the junior tape was enough to keep him at that number one slot without having some, you know, firsthand eyewitness tape, uh, excuse me, firsthand eyewitness viewing of him. I still think he's good. I, I still think he's worthy of being a five star. I just think body of work for me, Dante Moore, you look at the, te- you know, look at the track record of his, you know, junior tape, I thought was tremendous state champion and one of the top, you know, best schools, not D or a D three school, um, but it's different in Michigan, right? It's still probably a top five program. Um, we saw him at OT7. He was unreal. Elite 11, he was our MVP. Um, love the tool set. Love everything about him. And I think he's not even close to being peaked. You know, he's going to physically get so much in, in, in better shape once he gets into a college strength and conditioning program. We mentioned Nico. Uh, Malachi Nelson's up. There. I mean, I love this 2023 quarterback class. I think I was telling you or somebody else that right now, Christopher Vizina, I think he's our number seven guy. And, and I might have him number one or two in last year's class. I like him better probably than Drew Aller and right there with Kid Klubnik. So, and he's seven for us, Chris Fazina. Yeah. So I think this year's class is great. And if there was a time to, to make that radical move, and I'm surprised no one else has done it yet, whether it be, you know, rivals on three. I'm surprised nobody else has made the move uh, to drop someone, to put something over, over Arch. Um, but, you know, again, Arch is good. And saying he's not means you either have never seen the throw or you should never talk quarterbacks because you're not qualified if you don't think this is a high level prospect i just thought body of work i, I like dante and, and without nico again not knowing if he was going to have a senior year i, I wasn't going to push him now that nico is going to have a senior year and he comes out and, and plays well I, I will be on the table for nico making making that push no matter what arch does as, as a senior so i think the highest ceiling is nico right now so the number one debate will go on all the way until january we have all american games we have senior seasons we're pretty much done with camps and events but We will have the all-important senior season. But as you mentioned, a loaded quarterback class. We didn't even talk about guys like Jackson Arnold, who was the Elite 11 MVP, Jaden Mm -hmm. Rashada. You mentioned Christopher Vizina. So a very stacked 2023 quarterback class. But we've talked about quarterbacks a ton in 2023. Discussions in previous podcasts, whatever. We have fans' questions. They want to know what's going on with recruitment. We've seen – Probably the, the, the craziest number of commitments at this point in any time. But people still want to know, you know, where are guys going? And then they also want to know, you know, player comps. One of the big things that we do in our evaluations are player comparisons. And the first question we have comes from Joe Gurrell. How much do you think about age relative to class for player rankings? I.e. Kyle Pitts being 17 in enrollment in college. Raylan Wilson turning 18 post high school grad. Lucas Simmons being 20 at high school graduation. And I always like to bring this stuff up. Now, mm-hmm. granted, I, it was 30 years ago, but my senior year in high school, I turned 17 two weeks before we started Hell Week for football. I started, I turned 17 six weeks before my senior year in high school started. I turned 18 a month before my parents dropped me off to college. Nowadays, I, I remember, and I won't say the player's name, but Greg, you and I joke about this all the time. Two years ago, during the presidential election in 2020, we saw a top 247 player who was <laughs> tweeting pictures, posting pictures of him voting in the election as an 18-year-old junior. All right? So he played his senior year at 19. He will be 20 when he plays as a true freshman. 
That's something that actually, it's a great question by Joe, because that's something that we have started to discuss more and more, these younger players compared to these older players, yet all playing in the same grade. And I'm going to go back to your experience with the Elite 11. I'm going to go back to your experience with quarterbacks. It's been more pronounced with quarterbacks historically, but you're in a, in a state where the holdback and the super holdback is almost becoming the, the norm, not the exception. It is a great question. And like you said, I'm, I'm, when it comes to quarterbacks, I'm, I'm actually surprised when it's a player who is the right grade for his age. Correct. So, it, you, you know, I, you typically think 15 year old freshman, 16, 17, 18 year old senior is pretty much the standard. It, the question is, does it go into our discussions? Yes, it does. Um, but do we have enough data yet to maybe make some, yeah, let me just say it this way. Um, if you are young for your grade, then we like that. Right. We think, OK, this guy is not even close, again, physically peaking. Um, he's going to go to college and, and he's got a lot of room. Maybe he's going to grow. Um, he can make a jump, whereas maybe a, another kid who's already 18, 19, he's probably peaked. You're not going to see a lot of physical development left. That doesn't mean he can't still be a great player. And what we have to make sure people understand is our rankings are an NFL draft projection. We don't care how they do in the NFL. Right. They can be in a 10 time Pro Bowl or, or never play a, a down. But our rankings stop at the NFL draft and what the draft still shows is that they're still drafting guys that were old for their grade in high school, right? Holdbacks are still getting drafted. So we're not going to necessarily punish that kid um, who maybe was a, a holdback who's, who's old for his grade because they're still getting drafted, right? They're still having college success and getting drafted. But I think what it does is the kid who's young, uh, we like him, right? We're going to, we're going to pump him up a little bit more rather than punish the guy who might be a little older for his grade. Yeah, and he probably got a chance to play earlier if he's older just because yeah. of the physical development. Yeah. Plenty of opportunities for you guys to ask your recruiting questions. Drop them in the live chat. Uh, we'll go to our next question. Uh, this comes from the Sports Fellowship. Uh, not to be confused with South Coast Fellowship, the church that my father pastored for a number of years. So, <laughs> Sports Fellowship. Is 7-on-7 seven seven now being viewed highly just like in-season play for scouting? I would say my answer to that question is vehemently no. <laughs> you know, our I'm number one player in the in the country, in the 2023 class, didn't play travel seven on seven. <clears throat> Offensive linemen do not play seven on seven. There has been many a players who had a viral video because they made one catch with four seconds. Of course, I can clip, made a catch. That does not mean that they're now going to be the number one receiver in the country. We have seen not recruited players, maybe get a stop. That doesn't mean they're taking all those. I mean, you and I joked, there was a dad a few years ago said, oh, I'm going to go take some stars. Like, mm -hmm. okay, so your son didn't give up a catch to that guy. All 30 offers that guy has are not transferring over to your son. It's not being viewed highly like in-season play. It never will be. It's used as another evaluation tool from an athleticism standpoint, from a competitive standpoint, for an opportunity to see these guys move around, to see how they play to see what their, their skill set includes. But the film is still, the 11-on-11 the, the 11 11 Friday night film mm -hmm. is still going to be factored in. And Greg, you know, you being in California, there's more 7-on-7 seven seven tournaments in Southern California than probably the entire world <laughs> combined. And, you know, we went to, or you went to OT7. You saw a lot of the top players. There were some that weren't there. There were some that were there. There were a lot of other guys that were just filling uniforms that aren't being recruited. But I think there's this misconception that fans think that if you play seven on seven, well, I certainly know this is how it is for parents. And recruits, well, my son plays seven on seven. Why is he not ranked? Why doesn't he have any offers? And I'm like, that sounds like a talent issue, not a <laughs> seven on seven issue. Your thoughts? I think I think there's there's value in every single thing, right? Like I went to a volleyball match to watch a left tackle who was a middle blocker because he lived, you know, San Ynez. You know that program mm -hmm. really well, Huff. But you know, he was a uh, he was a kid I didn't get to see in, in football, but he was a, a middle blocker. And so you're watching the kid and I'm looking for movement. You're looking for lateral ability. And it sounds dumb, but like when you're playing volleyball, especially if you're a middle blocker, you got to have, you know, high level athleticism and, you know, just the quickness, the feet, the shuffle, uh, being able to jump. That all translates to football. Um, we're again, we say it all the time. We're big on multi-sport athletes, not just track. You know, we talk about guys that are good in basketball, e even baseball, not known as the most athletic sport, but there's still value in all that. So I say all that. To say this, there is value in seven on seven, but not even close to what real football. And I, I'm calling it, I call pads real football. And I just, last week I was at a tournament and I, there was a, a five, eight cute little receiver who has four catches over two years. I'm not exaggerating. 
um, over the last year, four catches over the last two years. And he, you know, did a little cute little route, which you couldn't do if there was real football because there's this thing called linemen that are actually, you know, in the way of the quarterback. Quarterback does a little sidearm pass uh, with no drop. He, he beats a, a really high-level cornerback, and dad comes over and goes, hey, he just beat a, a four-star corner. Where's his ranking? This isn't, you know, the, the film, and he actually pointed to the, he goes, the film here shows that he should be rated. And I said, sir, and I always try to be kind but stern. And I said, sir, I go, the film I'm more concerned about is the four catches for two years, not this cute little seven-on-seven seven short and T-shirt stuff. That's not really factual, and that stuff, that route he just did, it'll never happen in, in a real game. And, and again, it's your, you're looking at projectable tools. And so you watch an OT7 and people would say, so we're not trying to crap on seven on seven because there is value. You're having a chance to see these guys physically, what they look like. You're looking for traits, not so much the actual finished product. So if I'm watching a corner, even if he gets beat, but I'm seeing him move, I'm seeing him drop, open up, cover, turn, how he breaks in the football, maybe his ball skills, maybe his compete level. That's more important to me than somebody who's just making, you know, some some nice little cute little routes and catches. So uh, even quarterback play, you're looking for – you can still see things like accuracy. Obviously, there's no pass rush, but, you know, there, you can still see, you know, ball placement. You can still see uh, maybe poise if it's a clutch situation where it's third down, you need to make a throw. Um, so there, there is value in it for sure, and that's why we, we go to so many seven-ons. You know, we're there all the time. It's not just to get, you know, recruiting information. but we're, So we're looking more at, at physical tools length um, in a corner. Um High level traits, athleticism, that does translate. So seven on seven does translate. But again, it all comes down to how you do on those Friday night lights. And, and you'll see kids get, I would say this, you'll see kids offered on seven on seven, but you can't commit unless that Friday night light tape actually matches up what you see in some of those seven on seven highlights. 100%. And as a tight end who played in the Veer offense, Back before there was travel seven on seven, we had high school seven on seven. Yeah, that was a great opportunity for us to get passes thrown to us. And I think back to two guys in particular that probably benefited from seven on seven. One is a 2023 commit, Cooper Flanagan, uh, out of De La Salle High School. And then the other was Devin Asiasi, who was a 2016 commitment to Michigan, ended up playing at UCLA, was drafted by the New England Patriots. But they both played at De La Salle, who runs the vaunted Veer offense that for years teams could not stop. But they're in an offense that's not necessarily going to showcase their pass-catching skills. They're in an offense that's going to showcase their blocking. So 7-on-7 seven seven was good for Ossie Ossie and Cooper Flanagan. They both played for KT Prep based out of the Bay Area. But it showed that they can do the receiving thing that schools are going to want. So there is value, like you said. But, again, it's never going to replace 11 on 11, 11, on 11 football. Good question there. If you have any other questions, drop them in the live chat. We got another one. This comes from Trey Scott. Hmm. is uh hey, i know that name is offensive line defensive line scouting more difficult with the opening finals gone i would say yes in a sense that that was one of the best events in the world the hmm. opening finals largely because the low linemen and the d linemen were in pads but again it wasn't a game situation so again there was opportunities to see you know who was quick who, you know, had the, the good pass rushing skills, you know, who were the guys that had the good feet, that knew how to block. But a lot of those drills still maybe tilted to one side more than the other. But losing that, losing that opportunity in pads, I mean, how many times did we go to opening finals and you get to see – I remember, Greg, in 2000 and – I think it was the summer of 2014, we watched a kid from New Jersey who was the only sophomore going into his junior year at the opening finals – Saw how dominant he was. Brian Doan gets all excited. And if you guys know Brian Doan, Brian Doan gets, doesn't get excited about anything that's not related to soccer. But Doan gets excited. He said, let's make Rashawn Gary our number one player. That was in July of 2014. He didn't sign for another year and a half because we saw what Rashawn Gary was doing in pads at the opening finals. And he was the wire. From that point on, he was number one the rest of the way. So we had great opportunities to evaluate. I don't necessarily think it's difficult to evaluate because there was still only, what, 15 O-linemen, 15 D-linemen going. But that was such a key evaluation tool because you had best on best. Mm. Yeah, no, it, best on best w was big. And like you said, they, they pad up. So it wasn't just guys kind of like grabbing at T-shirts and, you know, was kind of trying to spin guys around. But again, you know, I, I still think back to, I want again, I don't know. My brain fog is, is horrible. You wouldn't know the year. But we had Khalil McKenzie. Mm -hmm. I believe he had a dominant MVP showing at the opening. 
Um, we had him number one, I believe, or at least in the top five, it, right? It was that same summer. Gary it's clinched the number one spot. McKenzie got the number one for the year ahead, but it was that yeah. same opening final. And I don't believe Khalil was drafted. Now, there were some other circumstances. Again, Khalil didn't get to play his senior year. I believe he transferred from De La Salle, where I saw him as a junior, went back, and, and just wasn't able to happen. And I, I always say, man, senior development is big in, in a lot of different areas. And he didn't get that and had some injury issues at Tennessee. But, you know, but you know, so I say that to say, uh, you know, I, I love the opening. It was awesome to see the guys pat it up. And again, but you're not, again, you're not just looking at performance and who was the MVP. You're looking at just – their bodies and, you know, their get off. If you're talking about a DN, you know, looking about, you know, his quick level twitch. And a lot of these guys don't have technique. I, I never sweat technique in high school. And not to change the subject, but, you know, we're talking O-line, D-line. I always feel like that, you know, schools can teach that easier. They can teach a guy to be long and athletic and have a little means, means nastiness to them, right? Um, I know, I don't know if we'll get to him later on, but, you know, Carmody McLean is a guy who, you know, I think right now we probably have him rated a little higher than, than the composite. And, at the OT7, you know, he didn't have a, a great event. But again, uh, you know, you're going to get beat at the high school level because a lot of these guys, we're talking about corners, just don't have great technique yet, haven't been maybe coached up as well. But you're looking at the traits, looking at the length, looking at the ball skills, look at the quickness. The high school production for Kalmani uh, is off the chart. So, again, don't just get off, you know, when, when we're evaluating, it's not just based off of performance. It's, it's always comes back to, okay, I know he beat him. But, but why did he beat him? You know, can this guy over here who's not coached, he's obviously raw, but, you know, just look at the frame, look at the feet, look at the, just the natural athleticism, look at the movement that this kid has. And, yeah, he's got a nastiness to him that, that you have to have. So that's where the opening I thought was cool because you see these big linemen who a lot of times, at least in, in California, you know, we don't have a lot of big guys out here. So you're seeing them dominating against guys that are 240. So at the opening, it's a chance to measure up guys, measure up yourself against guys that are their own size finally, and then to say, okay, now, now we know who's dogging. Maybe who's not? So you're getting to see guys like a Nolan Smith, a Xavier mm -hmm. Thomas, or Sean Gary, and Brian Brissy. You're getting to see those guys going against the best offensive linemen. They would never play in a Friday night season, but they're mm -hmm. then playing against them in these events. And, you know, are there going to be some guys that dominate in those venues that don't necessarily have great film? Yeah. You know, I, I think back to the 2018 opening finals down in the first year that they did it at the Star in Frisco. You had the number one overall pick in the draft this year, Trayvon Walker there. You had a top five pick in Kayvon Thibodeau there. I want to say you also had Nolan Smith there. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was graduated by then. But I know we had Thibodeau and Trayvon Walker there. Nolan was and there. Who, and who was the D-line MVP? Jacob Bandys, who I think has played sparingly at Washington. But he was phenomenal that week. Yeah. So yeah. even those events can sometimes be fool's gold, believe it or not. Um we got another question that somebody wants to ask. Can you explain Jaden Wayne's ranking? I get he was a four-star, but I feel like he is a five. Y'all are the experts. Just want to hear your two cents. I'm a big yeah, Jaden Wayne one, huh? you want me to I'm going to take this one? That's all yours, Greg. I'm totally kidding. This is all you. Nobody just – I don't know. If people know. Like, I'm not trying to brown nose the host, but, like, nobody knows anything in the Northwest. You've seen these guys, like, seventh, eighth grade. So, even before they got to high school. So, if it's a Jaden Wayne eval, like – you're going to have such an authority on this one. And so it's the, the floor is definitely yours, but just hope people know that, you know, before he was Jaden Wayne, you knew him before then, right? You knew him before he was just, you know, before he was the, the man that he is now. Listen, I remember when Jaden Wayne was thought he was a quarterback. All right. He was a sixth grader. His brother, Deshaun Wayne, who now plays football at Georgetown was telling me about his younger brother. And he'd send me these pictures of his younger brother, who was like a foot taller than Deshaun, who was a corner. And he's like, yeah, this is my brother. He's a quarterback. I said, your brother's a defense fan. And going through different stages of his middle school until he got to high school, Jaden thought he was going to be a quarterback. Then he thought he was a tight end. Then he thought he was a linebacker. But he's an edge. He's a pass rusher. He's a top 40 player nationally. He's been a top 40 player nationally on 24-7 sports. The whole ranking hubbub that happened on the day of his announcement was because another website has him ranked so low that it skewed the composite. All right, so we've been pretty high on Jaden from the get-go. This offseason, Jaden played seven on seven. He didn't do any camps. He didn't do any events, any national events as a pass rusher. He did it as a tight end because he still has that offense in his heart. The best thing for Jaden, I think, and I love Masaki Matsumoto, the head coach at Lincoln High School. Uh, Jabari Johnson, the quarterback, four-star quarterback, going to Missouri. Uh, there at Lincoln. But Jaden leaving Lincoln to go to IMG his senior year is going to be huge for him. 
because that's going to give him that opportunity to really continue to develop as a pass rusher. You know, interesting enough, the new defensive coordinator there was a guy who was recruiting him a few years ago when he was in high school, when, when this guy was in college, and now he gets this chance to coach him. So you could see why he had all these offers. But I think Jaden just needs to focus on being a pass rusher instead of being a receiver. He's not a bad tight end. He would have probably been a top two, four, seven tight end with his size, with his athleticism. But the big thing for him is just continuing to develop as a pressure, as a, as a pass rusher. Where he's bringing the pressure consistently. Where you know when the offensive line they have to double double team, they have to figure out a way to stop him. And there were times during his junior year, I was at a game uh, week three where you know you expected him to make more plays. He's got all the physical tools. Now it's a matter of him focusing exclusively as a defensive end. He's four spots away from being a five star when we expand to the top thirty two. He'll have a senior year at IMG. He'll have the All American Bowl. And the Polynesian Bowl, he'll have more opportunities to move himself in there. But this isn't like we've got him ranked in the top 200, 250. Mm -hmm. He's been a top 40 player on 24-7 sports since the very first ranking. And just to add, not to Jaden, but just to, you know, just to the people wondering, hey, he's not a five. Uh, we're going to update in October, right? We're going to do at least, at least two, if not three more uh, updates to the 2023 class. So I, I just, I want fans to know, if you're not happy with where a kid's at right now, these are super fluid. So a kid can go from being a four-star right now, uh, he can make a jump in October, or he can go kill at the All-American Bowl, make a jump then, or go to the Poly Bowl where you and I will be at, mm -hmm. drinking some whatever it is we'll be drinking, having a great time there. So these kids, are gonna, they're going to get seen quite a bit, and Jaden will have a chance, as will everybody else. These are fluid rankings, and uh, don't get upset if you don't like where he's at right now. Plenty of time to move up. Plenty of more time for questions. If you have a question, drop it right there in the live chat. We got another one uh, from me, Junior, not me, Junior. That would be my son, who I don't think is on here. Do the All-Star Games hold more weight now? I would say yes and no. And, mm. and here's why I'll, I'll start off with no. Because there's a lot of guys that will not play in an All-Star Game, whether it's an injury relation. Remember last year at the All-American Bowl, all right? I was covering the game. I was part of the sideline crew for the All-American Bowl on NBC we interviewed all the players when they came in on Monday all right by Tuesday's practice there were about 25 guys that had come through registration on Monday that were out for the game that were not able to play in the game and some of those were players that were in the top two three four five okay maybe not I think they're top 10 top 15 they didn't practice that week they didn't play in the game okay so the year before there was no Polynesian Bowl. There was no Army All-American Bowl. I'm sorry. There was no All-American Bowl. There was no Under Armour All-American game. So the last two years, you've had one round of games not get played. Another game kind of get hurt by COVID testing. So the All-Star games maybe don't carry as much weight because they just haven't been as readily available. Now, to the answer of yes, that is the ultimate best on best. Okay, now, Greg, you go to Orlando each and every year for the Under Armour game. I go to San Antonio each and every year for the All-American Bowl. We both go to Hawaii with Blair Angulo for the Polynesian Bowl. Hawaii is kind of what you expect. Guys are in just a helmet Monday through Thursday or Tuesday to Friday, and then they play in the game on Saturday. You know, it's a little bit more laid back. Under Armour, All-American Bowl, they both are in pads for at least one of the practices. But even then, you don't see it. It's not the Pro Bowl where they're basically playing two-hand touch. <laughs> but you're not seeing the intensity in practice as you have in years past, but yet when you are, and then during the game, you're still seeing best on best. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with all that. I think you always have to be careful with, you know, we'll call it recency bias or just getting too high or too low based off of a, a quick eval. And again, All-American Bowl, uh, Unarmor is always – First off, the practices are usually more valuable than the games, correct, Huff? Like, yes. you get more probably at those, those four or five practices watching than the game. You never – like, receiver maybe doesn't get the ball thrown to him after he killed it all week. So, we're not going to – you know, it's always the practices and what you see there. But, you know, last year, our, our number one guy, Travis Hunter, and he he deserved to be number one. One of the better skill players I've ever covered in almost 30 years. You know, he, he was just – you know, he wasn't a standout at, at the practices or even in, even in the game, but just – one of those deals. So you always got to make sure you don't get too high or too low after a game. Again, there's there's value in every single opportunity to evaluate someone. There's always uh, that that in-person 
uh, eval that, that plays a lot of, you know, plays a lot for us. But I don't think we ever want to get to the point where maybe we get so high on a, on a player when the, the, you know, the body of work doesn't suggest what we just saw. You know, we, if we see a guy for three years doing, you know, showing himself to be something, maybe he gets hot for one or two days. Okay. You know, let's make him not, you know, in the top 10 now, like there's danger in that. Right. So mm-hmm. I think, um, I think you, you, you take it with what it, what it is. It's a great opportunity to, to evaluate, but hopefully it kind of more coincides with what you already saw in the kid and you don't make radical decisions up or down. You know, perfect example of that is a guy you're plenty familiar with, Ray Sean Speedy Lute. He mm. was the MVP of the All-American Bowl, had kind of an up and down season from an injury standpoint, but had a great All-American Bowl because he had a couple of great runs. Mm-hmm. But that's the other thing with these All-Star games is that they're, these coaches are trying to rotate as many guys in as they can. You know, they're trying to develop chemistry at key positions in four days. These are high school head coaches. These are guys that, like, are the second that their season ends in November or December are saying, okay, guys, tough loss, tough way to end the season. See you in the weight room on Monday. All right? They're all about continuity. Mm -hmm. Now you're telling them to take the best players in the country and then develop chemistry in four days. You know, it's impossible. So that's why I think the games itself, the games themselves don't necessarily tell the the whole tale they can complement what other guys are doing. I mean, there's yeah. been times where we've seen guys that have been phenomenal in the game do nothing in college and then vice versa. Yeah, and I I'm, don't want to name a name to embarrass somebody, and I can't believe we're actually going to praise Brian Doan twice in one show, but that's – I don't know what I'm doing right now doing that. But, you know, there was a guy, right, who had a phenomenal – I believe it was at the All-American Bowl, had a phenomenal week of practice. He got elevated up to the number one overall player, and Brian Doan said, no, do not do this. There was some stuff. You know, again, don't want to use the, the B word baggage, but he, he was against it, did it anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, we all are kind of regretting making him, you know, the number one guy just based off of how he looked that week of the All-American Ball practices. So never want to get too high or too low. A long, long-winded way of saying that. I don't want to talk about who had Trayvon Walker as the number one guy and their five stars. Okay, I will. It was me. Oh, you uh, you you yeah. love you you you'd love to pat yourself on the back a little. I just bit. want to throw that one a little bit right there. Uh, we got time for more questions here. If you have any questions, drop them here in the live chat. Uh, we got another one. Is it jarring seeing the difference between front seven players in the SEC footprint versus the West Coast at national camp settings? That comes mm-hmm. from Joe Guerrero. He's got some good questions. I'm going to answer this now. I'm going it, to. It's not going to entirely answer Joe's question, but it's going to be the come to Jesus moment that I had. And it's a player that you and I both have we've discussed in multiple years, Greg. And I'll let you answer the question just because when you cover the Under Armour game, you know, you're, you're doing the California High School game of the week. You go to Under Armour, and those guys are almost all SEC players. But for me, you know, I've been doing this job for about nine years, ten years, and I'm down at the 2013 Under Armour game down in Orlando. And I'd been there two years before. I'd seen Jadavion Clowney. I had been there in, you know, in previous years. When, you know, you had Daquan Bowers there. That year you had Robert Kendici, Reuben Foster. But it was actually two skill position players that kind of jarred me. The Maury Street fellow at that time was the number one ranked receiver on the West Coast in the 2013 class. At the time he was committed to the University of Washington where I think he played his first two years. He was the most pristine looking pass catcher in the West region that year. Receiver or tight end. 6'4", 215 pounds. I mean, just looked like he was drawn up by a wide receivers coach of what you want a guy to look like. And I'm sitting there with with one of our colleagues in the industry who was at scout.com at the time where I was at. And he's standing next to O.J. Howard. O.J. Howard was 6'7", what, 225, 230. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go a little old school here for those of us that grew up in the 80s. The more a string fellow looked like Gary Coleman standing next to OJ <laughs> Howard. And I walked over to our, our Southern guy at the time. I said, all right, dude, I give up. Southern guys just, they're just better looking players than mm-hmm. the West coast guys. OJ Howard obviously ends up going to be at a first round draft post, wins a uh, draft pick at the bucks, wins a national championship at Alabama. But that was the moment for me where I stopped trying to say, Oh, California West coast kids can, can stand up. That was my kind of come to Jesus moment. But you go to Under Armour every year. You see that difference. What's it like? When did you kind of have that realization? I mean, so it was, you know, back in my student sports days, um, you know, traveling the country, doing the Nike camps. And I was kind of like you. I was a West Coast, California homer because that's all I saw. And then you, you go to the camps in Georgia. You go to camps in Florida. And you see kids in the South. And it is radical. 
how the difference is in terms of like just the the sheer size of the kid and, and not just the sheer size, the amount. And, but I feel like it's been more pronounced over the last five, six years. People always want to talk out, out West, you know, the PAC 12 is down, you know, what's wrong with, you know, PAC 12 schools, what are we doing wrong? And I've been very vocal in saying we don't produce the linemen and you kind of need those guys to, to win football games. Right. And so, you know, I think when Mario Cristobal came and took over at Oregon, one of the first things he did was he said, I don't whether he said it with his words or said it with his actions. He said, I, we need to go national for offensive linemen. And it was just a, it was kind of an indictment saying they're not here. And, you know, Urban Meyer for me is, is Mount Rushmore, one of the four best of all time. And he's forgotten more about football than I'll ever know. But he was talking about the USC job. And he said, you can win a national title at USC. You don't have to leave the, um, a 10 mile radius of your, of your campus. And I said, absolutely not. That is Urban's he's, he's all wet on that one because 10 miles of the USC campus. Uh, we do not have 20 linemen on both sides of the ball like you do in other parts of the country. They're just, they're just not here. I don't know where they went. People always ask, hey, where were they? You know, how did Pete Carroll do it? And just a different time, I guess. But, you know, it pains me to say, but no, there, it is a radical difference. You know, this past year, I think the top offensive lineman in California was Ernest Green. Very good. He's going to Georgia and he's going to play. He's going to play a lot and hopefully go to the NFL. But, you know, the number two guy behind Ernest, I don't even know who it was. Number three guy, there's 20 guys like Ernest in the South. And so it's not just, you know, they have dudes, but they have so many of them that it's it's until the West Coast schools can somehow, you know, find a way to compete up front on both sides. You know, we have pretty good skill, always going to have quarterbacks, but offensive linemen and, and interior D linemen, D tackles, O linemen. They don't have them out here out West like they do in the South. We'll, we'll have a few, right? There'll be a few Drake Jacksons. You know, we'll have a Corey Foreman. Um, we'll have a Kayvon Thibodeau. But again, just the amount that they have in the South, they just produce them a little differently out there. You know, interesting enough, you mentioned the, the skill position players. If you go watch the national championship game, the Heisman Trophy winner from Southern California, mm -hmm. the tight end who scored the last offensive touchdown in the national championship game from Northern California, who was the 24-7 sports true freshman of the year, Brock Bowers. And then the guy who put the nail in the coffin to end that game, Keely Ringo, a cornerback from Arizona who yeah. grew up in Tacoma, Washington. So the skill position players, the West Coast, at Cameron Latu, who I think had two touchdown yep. catches in that game mm -hmm. from Utah. You know, you, you look at the skill position players and shoot the Rose Bowl this year. One of the most exciting Rose Bowls in, in the non-Texas USC category. Maybe the best Rose Bowl that I've seen in the last 20, 30 years both those quarterbacks were from the CIF Southern section. One, Ventura County, Cameron Rising, shout out 805. Mm -hmm. The other, C.J. Stroud, who heads into this season. I mean, the two hottest names for the Heisman Trophy this year are last year's winner, Bryce Young, from Southern California, and C.J. Stroud. But when it comes to the linemen, like you said, it is just different. When they say mm -hmm. it's, it's different down south, they're not lying. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions here. Uh, if you want to drop one in here. You can drop your recruiting questions here in the live chat. We are here to answer your questions. Uh, Greg, before we get to that, we got a couple other announcements coming up uh, that will be televised on CBS Sports HQ. Uh, we got Olas Alinen, who will be announcing on Friday, July 22nd. He will be announcing between Alabama, Georgia, Miami, Ohio State, and Oregon on CBS Sports HQ early, 9 a.m. Eastern time. That's uh, 6 a.m. Pacific time. Maybe that's why they're wired different because they have a three-hour head start. Uh, <laughs> you've got Malik Bryant out of Orlando, Florida, Jones High School, a top 100 player. He will be announcing his decision on Saturday. And then Peyton Kirkland, another player out of Orlando, but at Dr. Phillips High School, will be announcing on Saturday the 23rd. So uh, a lot of activity. It's been kind of fascinating this year to see how many guys are announcing this soon. You know, mm -hmm. when we had the early, uh, uh, early signing period, more guys were announcing in December than in February. But now – Really, the first two, three weeks in July had become kind of like the new, the new signing day, if you will. Mm -hmm. No, and and it kind of just goes to you know what I said from the get go. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me that we have an early signing day six weeks before the late signing day. That, that's not really much, you know. That, that there's I, I could go on and on, and I know we've already been going on for what is forty minutes. Got a forty minute show here, huh? Probably need to wind it down pretty soon, but have the early signing period now, right? Have it late August, and I think everybody benefits. These kids. And go ahead and sign and people say oh you're locking these kids in dude it's nowadays it's so easy for these kids to get out of a letter if they really want to mm -hmm. i think it helps the colleges because they don't have to babysit the kids all year if the kids already signed they don't have to continue to recruit them already but you know that's how basketball does it they have you know an early period 
And then they had the late one after the season, ones before, ones after. Do it that way, not six weeks before. I feel like, you know, ADs get pressured into making coaching decisions between December, January, before they're really ready to do it. But they feel like they need to because that early signing period. So it, it, June it, it has been huge. And so has July in terms of these commitments. And so let's let these kids go ahead and, and sign and, and alleviate that part of the stressful process. Good for the colleges. And it's a win-win, I think, for everybody. But again, that's another... Never show probably to to, uh, to debate that one. Well, you know, the, the one thing I will say too is that you know it, re recruiting hasn't completely shut down. We're in the middle of a dead period, but the quiet period begins on the twenty third. It'll go till July thirtieth. We've got a number of schools nationally that are hosting cute little barbecues, Friday Night Live, Saturday Night Live. I mean, we, everybody's got now a catchphrase or a new name mm. for their event, and it's cool. I, I can guarantee you that the head coaches who are hosting that are rolling their eyes at some of the titles of the events that their school is hosting, but they got to play the game. They got to smile and nod and be excited about it. Uh, but that one week window becomes very crucial because that's the last week period. You can have guys on campus until the season starts in September. And for a lot of cases, they're using that last week in June, or I'm sorry, last week in July to really close out with their 2023s, but also to start getting more face time with the 2024s as more and more schools are filling up their spots. But that is it for this week. We have had a great time answering your questions. We look forward to doing this again next week where we can answer more of your questions. I'm sure we'll get the same questions that we get all the time, all the way every week, even though this is the first time we've done it. There's some that I'm sure we're going to get all the way until the end. But for 24-7 Sports Q&A, for Greg Biggins, I'm Brandon Huffman. Thanks for tuning in.